so happy that you've also joined us. We are live webcasted today, and we have so much great information, so many different skills to share with you today. Um, just a great group of women, and I mostly am speaking of these two fabulous women right here. My name is Betsy Hicks, and I have been a diet counselor for a decade. I, my husband and I own a holistic medical clinic up in Delavan, Wisconsin. And we, um, and I have been counseling families on dietary intervention for the, the past decade. My specialty and what I will be bringing to the table a lot today is, aside from just some nutritional knowledge, I specialize in picky eating. So I really want to help you get the pickiest of eaters to be able to eat well. I don't know any child that kind of automatically just starts wanting to eat nothing but vegetables and meat. I think there are a few of them if they're really, really raised in the right environment, but most of us start off our lives and thinking that macaroni and cheese is the way to go and it's a healthy way to go. So what I want to help you today, is we'll be talking about lots of things, is how to turn your child around so that they no longer are a picky eater. So I am pleased to, to be here. Next we have Julie. I'm Julie Matthews. I am a certified nutrition consultant and I have been researching nutrition and dietary intervention for autism for about seven years since I started writing my book uh, called Nourishing Hope. And I am here today to participate and I, I'm going to be doing a lot of the SCD piece as well as I'm going to bring in some concepts of traditional foods and things like fermented foods and way of making foods more digestible. So I have a practice in San Francisco and I see clients from around the country and around the world by telephone. So I'm looking forward to today. Thanks a lot. Hi, and my name is Susan Vess and I have a business called Special Eats. I am a chef and author. I write for Living Without Magazine. And, and actually, Betsy and I just filmed our first in a series of four cooking DVDs, Cooking with the Seasons. So I am very excited to be here with you, and we are going to cook wonderful foods for you today that you'll be able to sample using great nutritional ingredients that are seasonal, that fit in all diets. We want you to understand that, that there is not one solution for, for everyone. You might take bits and pieces of all the diets and plug in what works best for you and for your family. We're very excited to have you with us today and looking forward to a fun day. Sure. And our point of view, we just wanted to share with you that diet really matters. You know, we, we think if we are on the GFCF diet, all we have to do is get rid of gluten and casein and we can eat anything else is considered health food, and it's not. And so we really want to talk about diet and how we can impact our diet in very healthful ways. We also want to talk about the positive qualities that are in all diets. There, there isn't, like I said, one solution. This isn't a cookie cutter approach. So we will talk about all diets, what's good about all of them, and how they might work for you. We're also going to talk about certain foods to avoid and certain foods to include, because there are some things that we think are bad for everybody, and we will certainly share our point of view. We'll also talk about what's good for everyone, and, and you might guess what that'll be already, some good healthy uh, fruits and vegetables and good meats. So good nutrition is essential to any diet, and those are some of the things that we're going to cover today. We're going to have the first two hours until 10 o'clock we're going to talk about all the various diets so you understand the components of each diet. And then we're going to take a break from 10, 10 to 10.15. Then we're going to cook, so just so you get a picture of what your day is going to be like um, while we're switching over here to the correct presentation. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the day. And I'm going to be handing out little cards for you to write down your questions. So as the day goes on and you think of a question for any of us, write that question down and then the last hour of the day we will answer your questions, all of us today, all of us together. And that's what I think is really important about this presentation, what makes it different over previous Autism One culinary presentations. All three of us are a united front. We're here to say we can help you with diet, we can find something that works for you, and and it's not, 
it's not sort of GFCF against SCD or, or anything else. All diets have great qualities, and we all have various uh, expertise in the different diets, and we're going to talk about all of those. We have this slide because to me this is something that you just have Susan said about kind of like this diet against this diet against everything. I think what we first need to convey to you is that there are so many reasons that a food can bother us. You know, you hear about, well, they're saying this about this diet, and, and, and um, but no, I kind of like that component, but the rest of it doesn't just resonate well with me. Okay. We're having lots of technical problems. Today. Can they hear me on? Will, will they be able to hear me on web if I keep talking? Not without a mic. I'm just gonna keep this until uh, we have. I don't talk anymore. Um, so. Let's go over some, just this really, really briefly, because it's important that you understand this. We're going to go through a lot of these different reasons today. But these are some of the main reasons why a food can potentially bother us. We may have an actual true allergy to it. We may just have an intolerance to it, so that it's something that's formed through leaky gut or an overactive immune system, which we'll be talking about. It may be because our blood type doesn't like a specific foods, and that's something in the, in the world of lutens, which is a different category together. Autoimmune disorders, celiac disease, things such as gluten intolerance, those can be parts of autoimmune reasons for a food being a problem. Lack of enzymes, we may not just be digesting our foods. Yeast or bacteria, you hear, you'll hear a lot about yeast and bacteria this week at the Autism One conference. Chemically altered, uh, chemically altered indigestible actually is just say fake food, that's what we mean by that piece. The pH imbalance, we're going to talk about how to balance the pH. And then the brain allergy, which is more of a new concept, and I won't be talking about that too much, except for in the, in the terms of corn, we'll talk about some of the allergies that we've been seeing happening in the brain and reacting to corn. So this, these are some of the reasons that food can be a potential problem. Okay, Julie's next. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. You've got to give Julie. Oh, oh sorry, Julie. <laughs> We'll mic up Julie. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? No, it's not on. Is it on? It's not on. They turn it on up there. They turn it on there. Is it there? I'm still on. <laughs> Working? Okay, great. So we wanted to talk a little bit about all the diets, and I'm actually going to go into a lot more information on this on my presentation on Friday when I, uh, I'm going to be doing a session before lunchtime. And, but I wanted to talk a little bit because you may have heard of many of these different diets, and w w there's always someone that will probably come to you and say, oh, my son or child did amazing on this diet, and you need to do this diet. And it gets confusing because there's five or six or seven or eight different diets and which diet to start with. So the two diets we're going to focus on today are gluten and casein-free and specific carbohydrate diet. They are two of the most impactful diets. They are two of the best ways to get started and evolve the diet. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that. But there's also other important things to know. There are other types of food sensitivities. and so just in addition to gluten and casein, and there might be soy or corn, and we'll talk about a little of that today. And you want to be aware of those as potential challenges. As Betsy mentioned, there's a the blood type diet, and you can incorporate that into any diet you're doing. There's the fine gold diet, and we'll be talking a little bit about phenols and salicylates today and how those can be a little problematic. So you may need to make certain ingredient adjustments based on that. Feast without yeast or body ecology, these are both different types of yeast diets, and those are important to implement for people with yeast overgrowth. The low oxalate diet is a newer one and can make things pretty restrictive and complicated, although can be very important for certain individuals. So it's one of those things that you may not need to think about it right now, but at some point it may be something that you might incorporate some of the principles. 
And then traditional diets, which is one of my favorites. Traditional diets is just looking at different diets that we use around the world, or we didn't use, that different cultures used that, we, that seem to be common in all cultures. And that's because these foods or these ways of preparing foods are really health promoting. Things like fermented foods and soaking and sprouting and fermenting grains and things like that. So we will talk about some of that this afternoon. We're actually going to add a new component this year and add some more things like sauerkraut and some different fermented drinks for your children. So that's the piece on the different diets to get us started. So the first diet that we're going to talk about is the GFCF, the gluten-free and casein-free diet. And just giving you the basics in case you don't know, I don't want to assume that anyone knows everything there is to know. So we'll just talk about what is the, the gluten and dairy-free diet, or gluten and casein-free diet. It is when you do eliminate all gluten and all casein. Gluten is the protein that's found in, in certain cereal grains, wheat, barley, rye, spelt, kamut, and, and there's more. We'll talk about those. And casein is the protein that is found in dairy of all mammals. So it's not just cow's milk, but goat's milk, sheep's milk, buffalo milk. So gluten, as I just said, um, there are all of these grains that we need to, to remove. The, the um, wheat, barley, rye are the common ones. Some of the tricky ones that I think are important to point out are things like spelt and kamut and triticale because they're often labeled wheat-free. And you think, oh my gosh, wheat-free, I can have this. But wheat-free and gluten-free are two different things. I have celiac disease, so I know this very, very well. Um, I was very excited when I first saw my loaf of spelt bread, and I read those ingredients, and it didn't say wheat. And I was very excited till I learned that spelt actually is wheat. It's an ancient form of wheat. So label reading is very important when you are eliminating gluten from your diet so that you know what you can and can't have. This one. The non-gluten grains and starches are plentiful. Some of these have better health properties than others. Even though I have up there things like corn and soy, we don't think that those are healthy things. But there are some great grains, amaranth and temp, teff and quinoa, that are, again, ancient grains that have lots of protein and fiber and other nutritional benefits. The problem when you're replacing a gluten-free flour for an all-purpose wheat flour is that it isn't an, a one-on-one. -on -one. You can't just replace all-purpose flour with rice flour. You have to have a blend of flours. And it's good to mix up some of the starches, like tapioca starch, with some of the healthier grain flours to make it a little bit better for you. So I talked about casein, and casein being the protein found in, in all of, all of the, the milks from cows, goats. There are some people, and, and Julie, I think you'll probably talk about this on the, on the SCD diet, that as your gut heals, do allow some sheep and goat's milk. But on the GFCF diet, we're eliminating all of these. And, and part of the reason for eliminating these is that frequently you can eliminate the opiate effect that you find in some of your children. And I think Betsy's going to talk a little bit more about that. The options for, gluten for, or for dairy free milks include rice milk, nut milks. Things to know about rice milk is you have to read those labels carefully because some, like I think it's, which was the rice dream has a little barley in it, and barley is gluten, so you don't want to use that. But there are some great rice milk, rice milks that are out there that are safe for us to have. You also can make your own. It's very easy to make your own rice milk, and the same is true of nut milks. We're actually going to make some almond milk this afternoon so that you'll be able to taste that. But you can buy some of these, and, and I'm the first to say that if you looked in my cupboard right now, you'll see those those little cartons of rice and almond and hazelnut milk and coconut milk, which is wonderful. It's got some good healthy fat in there. Um, I keep those around for those emergencies when I want to have something to add to a recipe. But I also make a lot of my own, especially if I'm going to drink something, if it's going to be in a smoothie, or if I just want a glass of milk to drink, I'm going to make my own. I'm not going to pour something out of a carton. I do. I should have talked about oats. 
Oats have always been considered to have gluten in them. And the reason for that is that oat fields were growing adjacent to wheat fields. So there was a lot of cross-contamination. The same equipment that was used for manufacturing, for harvesting the oats was used the day before to harvest wheat. So oats was off the menu on a gluten-free diet. However, last year, they started making harvesting, growing, dedicated oat fields that have dedicated equipment and dedicated packaging. There are three companies right now. There's one in Canada, there's one in Wyoming, and I believe the other one is North Dakota. They're all available on the internet, and they are also available at a wild oats store, if you have one of those in your area. A lot of the health food stores are carrying them, and they're wonderful. It's great to be able to add oats back into your diet again if you're on a, a gluten-free diet. People like me, um, we're very excited to find that. If you want more information about that, you can see us at the break, and we'll be sure and give you those details. So in understanding why to implement a gluten and casein-free diet, you have to understand a little bit about enzymes, and you have to understand about digestion. Because so many people get gluten intolerance, celiac disease, and the inability to break down the, the, the peptide of, of gluten as they're, they're all very completely different. This is not as much an autoimmune situation as the others are. This has to do with this lack of ability to break down. So let's start with what it is. Gluten as it is this long chain amino acid, or casein as a long chain amino acid, is supposed to be able to be broken down by an enzyme in your body. The enzyme that normally breaks it down is called dipeptidyl peptidase 4, or it's referred to as DPP4. That's the enzyme that's responsible for breaking down this. Well, what happens in so many of us, including myself and my husband and my children, is that somewhere along the way, this enzyme either is destroyed or it's blocked, and it doesn't work properly. So when that happens, if you eat something with gluten or casein, frequently these, this um, undigested, well, this amino acid that's not getting broken up is crossing the blood-brain barrier and creating this opioid effect. What is an opioid effect? The, the, the amino acid of gluten and casein is only one tiny amino acid off of that of morphine. So it creates this opioid effect, this kind of same type of thing that you, how you would react to morphine. Now, everybody would react to morphine very differently uh, if you were taking it on a daily basis. And this is, has to do a lot with all the different symptoms that you would particularly see. I'd like to add to this, um, I mean, there's, there's so many, the moodiness is big. And you know, when we, we talk about this today, this is something we haven't mentioned yet, but I'm very passionate about, is that this is not just for your child. This, this is all the different nutritional tips we're going to give you today. You know, it, it, it kind of makes me sad when I see the family all eating junk, and they, then this one child is just getting this very restricted special diet, and then everybody else is continuing. You know, maybe think of it from the way that this child was sent to you to teach you something. And, and that, that's a way to look at it, that maybe you can all benefit from going on a diet such as this. And there's usually, because the inability to break down that peptide is so somewhat genetically based, the predisposition for it is somewhat genetically based, then there's a good chance that one parent has. And I'm sure whatever parent is here is blaming the other parent. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. What we, what we want to, to know is, can you benefit from this as well, too? And moodiness is a big one. I mean, it's, it's that kind of hot coal. You can see this in a child. You can see when, I, I've, I've seen it in our clinic, when, when patients come to see my husband, and the, the kids are just like running like crazy, running like crazy, and they come to the mom, and they're like begging for those Oreos or those goldfish crackers or whatever it is, and then the parent gives it to them, and then they eat it, and it's like, ah. It's like a drug he's just been given his fix. I mean, it really, I, I don't mean to be so harsh with it, but it really is very much in that same type of a craving. And then they have it, and they're feeling so good, and they're so relaxed for a while. And then about 10 minutes goes by, and then you can just see the zoom go into action. And that's usually kind of that extreme hyperactivity that kind of develops from that point on. The unexplainable gi explainable giggling can also be a yeast issue, but it can also be that kind of high. And that, but spaced out is, is more of a way to put it. Most people who start a gluten and casein-free diet that are affected say it's like a fog was lifted. 
And, and how quickly are you going to see that fog lifted? That, that can depend because um, I, I have three children on the diet and myself has, has been on it and my husband as well. And for, my chil for two of my children, the effect was immediate. For one of them, it took me, took me months to see. For myself, it really took me months to see as well too. But it, overall, when you kind of test it, you can see that there's, um, you can see the regression. So, all of these other things, multitasking, never feel full as big because just think of it, if that's your high, and this, this can really go to a lot of adults, the ones that just can't seem to ever feel full, it's because you're just constantly having that craving. Urine and stool control is big, and crave only in, uh, gluten and casein, and that goes along with extreme picky eater. If you tell me that your child is just the best eater, they love their meats, and they like a good variety of foods, and then I'd say, you know what, this probably is not your issue. Gluten and casein is not your issue. It's the parents that say to me, only, my kid's only eating five foods, that I'm saying, yes, this is your issue. Of course, when they tell me they're only eating five foods, I say, well, what foods are they eating? And they say, well, goldfish crackers, um, Nutri-grain bars are usually one because parents think that that's a healthy food, um, uh, chocolate milk, um, peanut butter crackers, things like that. And then I say, but, you know, it, it, so they'll say, well, if I take these foods away, they're, they're going to starve. And I said, but your child already is starving if that's what they're eating. They're getting calories by these foods, the pizzas and the macaroni and cheeses. They're getting calories, but they're not getting any nutrition. And that's what today is about. We want you to get nutrition into these kids because they are nutritionally starving. And that's where we want to help you. So let's go on from here. Okay. So how to implement this. We want... First, for you to learn how to cook without processed foods. We want you to use foods. One rule of thumb that I, I love, I worked for Dr. Mercola years ago, and one of the things that he had said to me that I loved was, if the food didn't exist 100 years ago, it's not worth eating today. So anything that's been genetically modified, re-changed and altered and made into look like some great superfood, if it didn't exist 100 years ago, don't use it. And the, the concept Whole Foods, and we're very grateful to Whole Foods because they sponsored a lot of the food that we have here today. But the, 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 the piece of Whole Foods, just think of that, those words, Whole Foods. That's what we want you to use, Whole Foods. Do not shop the aisles of the store, shop the perimeter. You've heard this before. Shop the outside of the store. You want to be buying things that are whole. Use alternative grains and flours as needed. Try not to always get stuck on these same rice, corn, potato type starches when you're working with this. There's so many fabulous grains out there. Quinoa was, is the most indigenous grain to our civilization. It was the American Indians used this as their number one source of, of grain as well as a protein. It's actually a grass, but as a protein as well because it's so high. And you can use that and incorporate that by making things like quinoa pilafs and things such as that. Amaranth, also high in, in protein. Teff has a wonderful, almost chocolatey taste to it. So when you use teff in things that, especially desserts, it can add a wonderful flavor to it. There's so many great grains that are out there. Using wild rice instead of always the white rice, because wild rice can be fabulous. It has a good nutty taste to it. Plan healthy meals for the whole family. We want you to really just be, as we said before, looking at this as creating a whole new way of cooking within your home. And then let's talk now a little bit about picky eating because this is something that's really true to just about mo the most people I have. And it's not just children, it's, it's adults as well that this is an issue with. Texture sensitivities is something we all have to be very sensitive to with these children. They have an overstimulation, many of them, in their mouth of, or they have extreme understimulation. And you can tell because sometimes it even fluctuates. What textures do they tend to like? Either it's got to be extremely crunchy or it has to be perfectly smooth. And that is very typical. So what you want to do when you're first starting implementing a healthy diet, you have to think, how can I make these textures pleasing to my child? What, what can I do? For example, if Soup, if you like to make a good homemade soup, last year we made a fabulous stock, and Susan's, and I'm sure Julie does as well. I don't know if you have soup recipes in your book. Okay, so, they, so you have these great soup recipes. If your child does not like chunks, puree them. 
Pureed soup is a great way to get a child who is texture sensitive. Making things crispy. We're going to be making kale today, but if it was a child that was texturally sensitive, I would say last year we showed how you can actually bake the kale and, and make it crispy. So we want to be very sensitive to that. When, when, we, when we're talking about the strictness, too, of, as to you know, this is something you have to do, and we want you to start working on this, and this is all these things that you need to be able to do. When you're making your substitutions, always put texture as the first thought. Picky eater issues. Let's talk about um, kind of an ABA approach to how to get a child to eat something that they normally wouldn't eat. Let's give an example of a child who likes French fries, and, but they won't touch meat, okay? How many, <laughs> just out of curiosity, how many people struggle with this in their own household? Okay. Great, I'm, I'm hitting home here. I'm sure there's a lot of you out there, even around the country, that are dealing with this. We need to get protein down these kids. It has amino acids. It's going to give them the building blocks for their brain. They need, they, for, for their hormones, their neurotransmitters to work, they need to have an ample amount of protein. So let's say we have, and we're, we're going to say for the sake of argument, a nice grass-fed organic piece of hamburger, which we'll be talking about later. But we'll, we'll, we'll just have this, this perfect little piece of hamburger here, and we're going to have these french fries. Okay. Now we're going to sit down at the table with the child, and um, the first concept, if, if, if they are in any sort of an ABA program or any sort of behavior program, the concept that we want to work on is called first this, then that. So make sure that if you're doing ABA or if they're doing it at school, that they understand the concept first this, then that. And that will help you implement this. So you start off, and um, children don't like to be intimidated. Here's the way I look at it before you even consider doing, making this child eat this meat. I have a friend of mine whose husband lives in China, and she goes to visit him back and forth all the time. And she tells me in China there are many places where they will eat worms. And that's perfectly normal and acceptable, and I have nothing bad to say about that at all because that's their culture. But think about this. What would it take to get you to eat a worm? What would it take? And that's the way you need to think for your child. Because what's the problem of the worm? You're afraid of the texture, aren't you? You're afraid of what is that texture going to taste like? And it's, and it's that concern of what is that flavor going to be? I've never had that flavor before. So you need to think that when you're introducing this to your child. So what would it take? Well, for one, you'd have to be darn hungry. And that means you don't have a belly full of juice that you've been drinking all day. And that means you didn't have a snack an hour before dinner time. And that means you haven't been sedentary. So you, you've been outside, you've been at the park, you've been running around, having a good old time. And now we're going to come and we're going to try something new because you're hungry. Okay? And you're really hungry. You want to be really hungry. So the way I say to start it is like the size of a pinky nail, even smaller, of meat. Just a small little piece. And then you have the french fry. And that's all is on the plate, the french fry and the teeny little piece of meat. And you show up, hold up the french fry, and you say first, excuse me, you hold up the piece of meat, and you say first meat, then fry. First meat, then fry. So they're going to grab the french fry and say, no, first the meat. And then you kind of, now if they're very texture sensitive, maybe the first time you just want to have them put it to their lip and then they get the fry. Okay, now you got to put the meat in your mouth and then they get the fry. And it goes on and on like that and you work it into it. And then you eventually work your way up to, um, I call them, I, I like to do like the tri, the tri plate dinners where you have your meat, you have your vegetable, your protein, whatever it may be, because it could be beans as well. Your vegetable, and then you can have, then you have some sort of a carb like the rice or maybe a little potato or something like that. And then to teach children to eat one bite, one bite, one bite, one bite, one bite, one bite. It's much less overwhelming to have one bite of vegetable and then a bite of meat and then get your carb as opposed to finish your vegetables then you can have your potato. It works much easier, a lot less overwhelming to do it in that type of a tri-form. So once you start working on this, children eventually will cooperate. But you'll say to me, and I hear this in my practice almost every day, and it, the mom will say to me, um, OK, I tried what you said, but it didn't work. And I'm like, OK, well, let's, let's take it apart. Let's see what, what, what didn't happen. So, as you said, well, 
we, we, I did it. I had the fry and I had the meat, and he would not put that meat on his mouth, so he just left the table. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So then what happened? Well, about an hour later, he came back, and I was so good, I was so firm, and I said, no, you have to eat that piece of meat before you get the fry. And he cried, and he tantrumed, and then he left again. And I said, good, you know, that's, that's good, because he's not going to starve in one meal, it's okay, you know, as long as he's drinking water, it's okay that he didn't eat that. So then what happened? Well, a couple hours, and it was time for bed, and he was going to go to bed, I didn't want him to go to bed hungry, so I gave him a bowl of cereal. Mm -hmm. This is what I hear again and again. And what are you teaching the child? You're teaching the child that if they hold out long enough, they'll eventually get what they're addicted to. Wouldn't you do the same thing with the worm? Wouldn't you be the same way? Well, let's see, if I just get, you know, if I hold out longer, maybe eventually they'll let me just have what I want. So think in their mind, and that will help you tremendously. These are not bad children. This is, these are, they're not trying to be difficult. So, okay, let's go on. Great. So one last comment I had on Betsy's presentation was just about wild rice. So wild rice actually is not the same family as Thank rice. You. So if you have a child that actually is sensitive Thanks. to rice, which I see a lot, then you can use wild rice as a good substitute. And wild rice is nice to incorporate so that you don't start creating any of these allergies to things like rice. So just a, a little side note on that before we go on. I wanted to talk about SCD. And as we had mentioned earlier, this is not one diet is better than another. It's to give you a sense of where you can go with the diet. So frequently I see people come into my practice and they'll start with gluten and casein free. And then often they'll want to evolve it to SCD. Now occasionally they'll just come in and they'll come to me and say, well the doctor said we should do SCD because we have X condition or symptoms going on. And we might just go straight to it. But just to give you a sense, sometimes there's this evolution. So you take out gluten and they're better. Oh, well now we might need to take out all grains and all complex starches. So let's explain what the specific carbohydrate diet, SCD, is and why it's helpful for some children. More over some of the other just gluten and casein free. So it eliminates all disaccharides and polysaccharides and only allows monosaccharides. So those are basically simple sugars like glucose or fructose. We want to stick with those individual sugars and not do the more complex sucrose, uh, table sugar, those other, all other sugars besides honey or fruit sugars are pretty much a combination of multiple sugars. And, or starches, which are a combination of sugars as well. And those are much more difficult for the system to break down. They require additional carbohydrate enzymes. And if you don't have those functioning well, then you don't break them down. And then you have all this carbohydrate floating around in the digestive system for what? For yeast and b bacteria and other microorganisms to feed on. So then you start feeding these microorganisms, which then creates more inflammation and damage to the gut, which then creates more leaky gut and more food sensitivities and a further inability to break down the food. And you can see the cycle just becomes this, what, what Elaine Gottschall called vicious cycle that is very difficult to break. And so the concept behind the specific carbohydrate diet is sticking with just the monosaccharides in the carbohydrate category. Of course, all of your other foods are still available, and we'll talk about those. But in terms of carbohydrates, we're just sticking with monosaccharides in order for those carbohydrates to just go into the gut and pretty much absorb without much need for digestion, taking away that food that would normally be feeding the yeast and all the other microorganisms. So th some things that you want to avoid on SCD, these are going to be all of the starchy carbohydrates, all grains, <laughs> corn, potatoes, all sugars, like I said, except for honey, uh, soy, all, you'll, you'll see the list. It, and as one of our audience members just mentioned, it can be overwhelming, and it can be also very difficult to implement. So it depends on a variety of factors what's going on with your child, how their digestion is. If they're doing gluten and casein free for three months or six months and they're still having a lot of GI issues, maybe they're having a lot of diarrhea that you can't get rid of even on this diet, you really want to consider going to the specific carbohydrate diet, giving it a trial and seeing how it goes. There are actually some easier things about the specific carbohydrate diet in that you can do fruit. And so if you're, say, on Let's say you're on a gluten and casein-free diet and you want to avoid yeast overgrowth, you might be also eliminating all sugar 
Well, on SCD, you're allowed to have a little bit of fruit sugar or a little bit of honey. Now, you don't want to go overboard because that will still tend to feed microorganisms, but you have a little bit of that sweetness in the diet. So there's actually some benefits depending on what your child eats or is willing to eat. There's actually sometimes a little more flexibility in some realms with this diet. So give it a chance if you're not seeing the results you needed from the gluten and casein-free diet. So not only... So when I say that we're focusing on monosaccharides, that's just for the starch part. You can still do all protein and all fats pretty much that aren't going to have additional monosaccharides in them. So meats and eggs and non-starchy vegetables, uh, nuts are great. So nuts are a great way instead of doing flour or grain flours or rice flours, you can do nut flours and cashew flours. And later today, we're going to be making some cashew nut crackers and we're going to be making some meatballs that we use almond flour. So you can still have those crackers and muffins and things, but using nut flours or other types of ingredients instead. So it, it, there still is some ability to implement this even with children that uh, are picky and like some of those, quote, kind of carbohydrate or snacky foods. We're just going to use different ingredients in their place. So some alternatives, as I just mentioned, you can make any of these nuts or crackers cookies with either nut flours or coconut flour. And usually nut flours are what we do as the first step on SCD. But for people that are doing low oxalate or something like that, they might be adding coconut flour or things to the diet for that piece of it. You can make milks out of nut milk, as Susan had mentioned earlier, and they are very delicious, and they are much more tasty than if you get the ones in the box. So if you learn how to make them, there is definitely a benefit to that. Coconut milk is another nice way to get a really creamy milk consistency. You can make desserts. We're going to make some nut balls that have some dates and some coconut, and they're really sweet and delicious and a great little dessert uh, treat for your kids. You can make fries. Again, Betsy was talking about texture, so if crunchy is their texture, you can, instead of making potato French fries, you can use butternut squash, which is one of the allowable kind of starchy type foods for whatever reason. It doesn't have those complex uh, polysaccharides, and you can make great fries with that. And then pumpkin pie filling, so you can basically make a pumpkin pie, but without the crust part, uh, and that makes a great, a great dessert as well. And that, again, the pumpkin and the butternut squash are kind of two of the exceptions that create that sense of that starchy feel without uh, being contraindicated on this particular SED diet. So many people will go to a restaurant and of course for the sake of argument at a restaurant it's best just to say I have I'm a, my son or I'm allergic to gluten and casein just to say the word allergic even though they're not really allergic um, we talked about already the whole reason for the the peptide piece and we talked about um, well, out the word allergy in general with the gluten intolerance and things such as that but I want you to understand the difference between IgE and IgG an IgE allergy is what tip, a typical traditional doctor would test for. They, you would go there, and this is, this is something I hear frequently. They'll go, you know, you're going to your standard pediatrician, and you go, I went to this great lecture, and, and I think my child's allergic to gluten and casein, and they'll say, well, we'll test them, and they're like, no, no problem with gluten or casein. Because very few of our kids um, have actual IgE allergies. Now the IgE allergies are the ones that are more immediate. They're the, the ones, the kids that had anaphylactic reactions, they'll have a, a quick hive breakout. Um, eczema is very common, although eczema can also be IgG as well. But when you have an IgE reaction, it tends to be immediate. It's more of an, an innate allergy, which means it's something that is more um, that it's more part of their cellular memory. It's not so, it's not just a superficial end of it. And that's where we're going to the IgE. The IgG, IgE is very, very, very common in autism. And not, mostly because of the fact that most of these kids have bad leaky guts and they have an immune system that's imbalanced. And we'll talk about those reasons in just a little bit. So I want to explain a little bit on how food sensitivities form. Now this is a patient of ours um, IgE food intolerances. They're also called ELISA tests. Lots of different people refer to them in different ways. Um, as you can see, the, so the, the 
they, the zero is obviously non detected. The very lows are the greens. The yellow are the lows, and it goes up to the most ones that we're concerned about are the threes that are the high. This is a very common type of thing to see. Usually when you get something like this tested, you can see. You can, in fact, see um, a lot of the common foods like soy, peanuts are frequently on here. Actually, this child didn't have a problem with egg, which is rare, because usually egg is a problem as well, too. Um, but uh, apples, another very, very common one to have. Here's the reason I'm bringing this up today. If you are re at a roadblock, like in other words, you start a GFCF and your child started doing really, really well, and then all of a sudden they either stopped progressing or they regressed. Frequently, this can be something that it can be a um, when, when, they, when they regress, it can be because of one of these foods, or it can be from a combination of these foods. So I do recommend getting these tests done as, for, as much as you can. And they change. This is the other piece of it. As the immune system heals and as leaky gut improves, a lot of these can go away. Uh, it depends what you're doing for the immune system. She, she asked how frequently would you recommend running it, and it would depend on what you're doing for the immune system. And we're going to talk about ways to be repairing things. So if you have done that aggressively, then six months to a year, you could do it. This is um, a picture of an actual uh, colon with the yeast forming in it. What happens is the yeast attaches itself to the walls. This isn't very clear. It's a lot clearer <laughs> in our picture. But uh, the yeast attaches itself to the walls, and it actually became, makes it porous, makes it like a Swiss cheese. So what happens is everything that you eat goes through the intestines, and it literally comes out and lands in the gut. Now, what's going to happen when the food comes out of the intestine is that your body recognizes it as a foreign invader, and it's like, boom, let's attack it. And then you start creating all these antibodies against it, which is why this other child's antibody test was so high. That's what would have been happening. So typically, if you say to me, my child eats peanut butter every day, they love peanut butter, or they eat it every single day, I can almost guarantee you that if you have an address, especially if they're eating Skippy, but I can almost guarantee you that your child has an IgG problem with peanuts. Because if you're constantly hitting the immune system and never giving the immune system a break to be able to just kind of let up from it for a while, rebuild its armies. I mean, Dr. Jane Eldar is really good about explaining the immune system and how it's these armies that it's just like you're battling them and you need them a chance to rebuild. If you're constantly throwing the same food at them, that become a problem. You know, there are some foods that are lower allergens than others. For example, rice is a low allergen. It doesn't tend to cause as many allergies as something like peanuts or apples or even bananas sometimes as well, too. Um, and then this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a great picture because it shows this, is, this would be a healthy gut. So in other words, the food particles would be there and it would, there'd be a nice barrier. This is a leaky gut. It shows how the food particles actually get out. And then this I wanted to explain was, was with the immune system. We have what's called a, a Th1, Th2 shift. And uh, any, I don't know who's speaking on the immune system at the conference. But it's, when this is imbalanced, then you're constantly, sometimes these kids are constantly finding antibodies. These are the kids that never get sick because they're fighting so many antibodies. They're, they're just, they're, their body never, never stops. And eventually it's going to crash. Now, the blood type diet, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today, and I, um, but I, I just want to touch on this because I do like not 100% of the blood type diet, but I do like some components of it, especially in paying, to att paying attention to the proteins that might be best for you or your child. Um, we, we recommend this diet to a lot of people, who, especially who want um, to, for diet control, for weight, weight loss control, for uh, high cholesterol, but it also is really good to understand the way that our body actually digests. The theory behind it, in a very, very simple way to put it, is think of our, who we are ancestrally is very much built into our DNA and our ability to digest. If we ancestrally lived in an area that was a, but they ate a lot of fish, then our body is going to digest fish better than somebody else's. And the blood types are very much 
broken up that way. For example, the, the gatherers, the ones who did more of the gathering and did more of the, the farming and the fields and all that works, those tends to be more of the A's. They don't do well on a lot of red meat, where the, A, where the O's were big hunters, and so they do very well on red meat. So I'm, I just have here, just for the sake, just so you can just, I, I, these are not all of the great, the best foods for each blood type, but I went through and I listed some of the best beneficial foods for each blood type, so you can look, look at it. If you don't know your child's blood type, um, you know, check with your pediatrician's office. If you don't know your own blood type, donate blood, and then they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get two good things happen. This is the B and AB blood type. Okay. Okay, so I want to talk about fermented foods because this is one of my favorite conversations. The fermented foods are naturally fermented by good bacteria. So these are classic food that we know of in our culture is yogurt. That lactobacillus acidophilus is a type of bacteria that helps to ferment the food, making it more digestible. And it will also populate the digestive system with all sorts of good bacteria that are going to help with many, many functions. And if you look at the list here, you see over and over again all of the benefits that these can help for children on the spectrum as well as everyone in your family. So of course it's going to assist in aiding digestion and helping regulate constipation or diarrhea because you're going to get that good intestinal balance going. It's going to help break down toxins, bacterial toxins as well as environmental toxins which is really important. It can actually break down used hormones and kind of keep the system going and healthy. It breaks down sugars, it helps with immune function, it helps to build certain immune system complexes and help keep the pH balanced and I think we're going to be talking about that a little bit later as well. A really important component to keeping the gut healthy and keeping the good microorganisms there and helping to crowd out the bad microorganisms that we really want to get rid of. So this is just a list of them. You can see it, they create vitamins and all sorts of things. I could go on and on and so this is one of the reasons I spend a lot of time focusing on fermented foods. Many of you that are doing some sort of a biomedical approach are probably taking some probiotics and in some cases some pretty hefty probiotics and they're great and I definitely encourage them and they can get a little pricey and there are other great ways in addition to support the system. There's some preliminary research that's showing that maybe fermented foods might actually colonize those bacteria better than some of the probiotics do. So another benefit to doing both of them. And I mentioned yogurt first, and many people are going to be doing a gluten and casein-free diet, so aren't going to be doing yogurt. And so I wanted to mention some of the dairy-free versions. There are lots of them. So there are many beverages, and these are actually delicious, and most kids really enjoy them. So we're going to be talking about some of them definitely this afternoon. Kombucha is a type of fermented drink, and we're going to be actually explaining that later on today. Kombucha is a basically kind of black tea, and it's it, okay, I'll, I'll give you the explanation, but it, it, it sounds not so great at first. It's black tea and sugar, but it's been fermented, so the sugar is fermented out, so you end up with all sorts of good components for the immune system and metabolism and digestion. And then the, the caffeine, we don't exactly know what it is, but it, it, Susan's first experience was 10 o'clock at night. You want to tell that little? That was so funny. <laughs> I was a little nervous about this fermented food thing, and I'm so grateful that Julie's here because this is her expertise. But because Julie lives in San Francisco and I live here in the Chicago area, and some of the fermented foods we're going to sample today took some time to prepare. So over the phone, she's been directing in me on how to make sauerkraut and how to make all of these good things that, that I can stand here and say are spectacular. They taste great. They're easy. I can do it. And, and I know you can enjoy it. But the first thing I tasted was a kombucha. And, and someone brought it. I run a gluten-free support group locally. And someone brought me a big jug of this. And they're saying, oh, this is so good. And it's got all these healthy benefits. And like you, I was really nervous. So she <laughs> pours me a glass of it. And it's kind of like eating worms. <laughs> I, I didn't want to, but I didn't want to embarrass myself or make this person feel bad. So I drank it. It tasted great. So I poured another great big glass and drank that. <laughs> uh -oh. And then she said, I said, so how do you make this? And she goes, well, you need a cup of sugar and cheap black tea bags. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just drank two glasses of sugary black tea and I'm going to go home and go to bed. But as Julie says, 
it was all fermented out. I don't know where it went, but I went home and went right to sleep. And <laughs> it was a good thing. Good, good. Thank you for that experience. That is often the experience that I hear from people. I rarely hear, hear people having a challenge. Kids that are hyper, I've never heard a problem with the caffeine. And tea also has phenols, but I've never heard of a challenge with the phenol. So something seems to be happening in that fermentation process, which breaks down a lot of the substances that might have been problematic. But it's a delicious drink. It's kind of got a sweet, sour. All fermented foods are very sour, and so there are ways that we can uh, either disguise them or make them sort of sweet sour. And since it starts with sugar, it ferments more and more sour into vinegar. So we want to catch it kind of right in between that stage. So it's kind of a sweet, sour, fizzy drink. I would consider it kind of like, tastes like a little bit of a frick of fermented apple juice. And then we are going to, if I go back here, we are going to talk about coconut juice kefir. We're actually not going to make that today, so I'll actually talk a little bit about it now. The coconut juice is the young green coconuts, that coconut water that's kind of, it's pretty sweet. And that sweet sugar is fermented out by kefir or kefir, and that is a type of bacteria and yeast. And the benefit to this type of a yeast is that it kills candida, and it's particularly helpful. So the good bacteria crowds out the yeast and doesn't allow a place for it to inhabit, but the yeast in some of these foods actually kills it. So kombucha and kefir both have have this good yeast that's particularly beneficial. And then we're going to actually be sampling and talking about some soda, which is really delicious and a way of using those kefir grains or some other ways of fermenting it to, again, get the, some of the sugars fermented out, but to get a nice, really fizzy, it's like a soda, it's really delicious, fizzy, but using some really good tea, some, not, not black tea in this case, but hibiscus, rose hips, things with some good nutritional value and making a really delicious soda that you can use in place of some of these others that you might, and making them yourself. You can buy some of these like the kombucha, but when you make them yourself, you have a lot more ability to control it. You can use green tea instead of black. You can use, you can ferment it a little bit less. So there will be a little more sugar, but it might be a little more pal palatable for your child than say having, uh, it may be more vinegary. So you have that ability to adjust it how you want it and how your child will like it. And then raw sauerkraut. This one takes a little getting used to for some kids. Some kids love it. If you have a child that loves lemons and really, uh, uh, flavorful foods, they love sauerkraut. Others, including myself, I have to say, it probably took me a couple months. I probably went through three jars in my fridge that went bad before I ever ate most of it because I wasn't quite thrilled about it, but now I love it. So just like Betsy was saying with your kids, you just have to encourage it, and a little by little, the more they get to know it, the more they enjoy it. And we're also going to use a little bit of that, the juice from the sauerkraut to make a dressing. So if you can't get them to eat the crunchy cabbage, you can at least use that good fermented juice and add it to certain things as well. So these are some of the good dairy-free versions. And then I want to talk a little bit about dairy because not everybody's going to be dairy-free. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier in the SCD part is that certain dairy products such as fermented 24-hour homemade yogurt are allowed on SCD. So if you can do dairy, usually what people will do is start with gluten and casein free and then add, uh, uh, yeah, and then add SCD. Often they're going to be avoiding dairy during that period, and you may need to still avoid dairy. But for those that are doing SED and can do some of these things like the homemade fermented yogurt that have wonderful beneficial properties, then you want to get the, uh, you'll get all those good benefits, and you can make it yourself in a variety of ways. You can make it with goat's milk or whatever milk you want, or you can actually, if, if raw milk is allowed and, and uh, available in your state, you can use raw milk. We won't talk about it today, but in my lecture on Friday, I'm going to be talking a lot about raw milk because I think it offers some benefits to those people that have healed up the gut a little bit and are able to do some dairy products. I think there's some wonderful bene additional benefits. So another piece of the sort of traditional foods and how to process your foods is talking about nuts and seeds and grains. So these, if you think of all of these foods are seeds in nature, they are what's used to grow a new plant. Seeds have special digestive inhibitors. If you think of their 
their evolution, their whole goal is to make it through the animal from one end to the other in the manure, plant in the ground, and grow a tree or a plant. So they have a lot of digestive inhibitors in them and nutrient inhibitors. And so it's important to get the best digestion possible from these and to avoid inflammation to do certain things to help mimic the natural process. So when you think of it, when a plant finally germinates, it's in a wet, slightly warm, slightly acidic environment in the soil. And that is going to knock off those digestive inhibitors, those enzyme inhibitors, those nutrient inhibitors, and allow those enzymes, those nutrients and everything to be activated and come forward and be able to be utilized by the plant or in this case by ourselves. So we want to mimic that germination process and that's what you do through soaking or sprouting or fermenting the grains. And that can really add another level of benefit. I think one of the reasons that SCD is so effective is because it avoids all of those uh, potent inhibitors. Some of the inhibitors are called phytic acid, oxalates, lectins. These do a couple things. Oxalates and phytic acid bind to calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron. Several of the minerals that kids on the spectrum tend to be really low with, no matter how much supplementation sometimes we seem to do. Could that be because they're getting these wonderful gluten-free foods but are made from grains that maybe some people are binding to those or still for some maybe creating inflammation and one of the reasons they need to go to SCD. So adding these soaking properties is a nice way to see if you can adjust the diet to make things more digestible and maybe not need to go to the level of restriction you'd otherwise need to go to. So we talked a little bit about this already, so I don't need to go into too much about it. This, I was talk, just talking about the soaking and fermenting. There's also lectins. Lectins are uh, a compound that can be very inflammatory, and lectins can be broken down through the process of fermentation, not by soaking. So there's additional level of benefits to doing some fermentation. And we're not going to do any fermentation here, but I know there's a, a great Indian, uh, traditional Indian recipe that uses rice and lentils and it's fermented on the counter. Something like that would be one, and they, they make them into pancakes and various things. Things like that would be ways of adding fermentation or, for instance, sourdough. Uh, many of you aren't going to be doing gluten, but there's a very interesting study on lectins for celiac that showed that fermentation process actually made some of these grains possible for people with celiac. Uh, it was one study and more needs to be done and I'm not suggesting you go out and do that, but just to give you an example of how these methods may be actually able to make these foods much more digestible and might be one of the reasons that in our culture today we have so many problems with them when in other cultures we didn't seem to have that problem as much. So for your grains, you can soak them in something you, everything is basically water. You're going to soak it in water. And then if you want to get more fancy, you can add a little bit of something acidic to the grains, like some vinegar or some lemon juice or whey, but whey is based with dairy. You can soak your nuts. I usually just soak them in water or a little salt water just for flavor. And then for your beans, actually, you want to soak them in something slightly alkaline, like a little baking soda, which will make them a little bit uh, better texture and easier to digest as well. So the, in terms of the diets, we went through these, so I won't spend too much time, but just wanted to show you, I just spoke at the Dan conference last month, and we were talking a lot about the survey results that come from the parents. There are thousands of parents in the Defeat Autism now community that have given their results or their experience with certain diets and you can see gluten and casein free diet is number one shows the most improvement for the most kids and is one of the reasons we always or very frequently start there and you can see just sometimes by taking out certain ingredients like eggs or chocolate that can tend to be some of those common food sensitivities can really show improvement. And then candida diets you can see is really wet, way up there as well with a good level of improvement. So these are all great ways to try some of these depending on what might be best for your child's individual needs. But you can see they're definitely worth trying because they all offer some really wonderful benefits. Okay. So whether you choose to follow the GFCF diet, the SCD, implementing fermented foods, it's really important that we do have good nutrition in everything we eat for all of us, not just for the, for the child, as Betsy said, but for the whole family. One of the articles I wrote for Living Without Magazine was 
called The Family Table. And, and I just want to say, when, when you segregate your child's food, think about how that makes them feel. You know, they may be segregated in other areas of their life, and, and maybe in school they have to have a special meal when everybody else, but at home, in our family, we should be safe, we should be secure, everything we should do together, in my opinion, we should embrace eating together. So all of us should be following great, healthy nutrition, eating those good meals. I, I had a good friend with a child on the spectrum and they would all eat, like Betsy said, junk food, and which they had locks on their cabinets so their child wouldn't get up and eat these junk foods. And then they would give him this little bean patty every night. And everybody's eating all this good food and there would be this one bean patty. And it just broke my heart. So I think that we all need to understand good nutrition. And, and just getting to the very basics of what good nutrition is, is the, is the reason I put together this slide. Everything that we eat is either a protein, carb, or a fat. That's it. I mean, short of water, we have everything has protein, carbs, and fat in it. And, and any diet that excludes any of these is not going to be good for us. And all the diets we've talked about today do include these. So when you hear about, like the Atkins, my absolute least favorite diet in the world, where all you eat is protein and you don't get the rest of it, they're not balanced diets. It's very important that we include protein, fat, and carb in everything we eat. So um, carbs are broken up into simple carbs and complex cards, carbs. And a simple carb has sugar in it. So when a simple carb could be, um, could be those cookies and, and things like that, where a complex carb has more fiber and other attributes in it, it's going to be some whole grains or nuts or fruit and vegetables that have fiber to go along with it. Um, just understanding that is really important. And the other piece, and Betsy's going to talk about this in a few minutes, is the pH. We, we have more to consider than just fruit, vegetables, meats, and, and, and fats. We also want to know about how to keep our, our pH balanced. So many of the Americans have a very acidic diet and we'll hear a little bit more about that. The other thing I want to say is fats. What the, I maybe, maybe worse than the Atkins diet would be the low-fat diet. No fat. <laughs> Our brains are made up of 60% fat. We need to feed it good, healthy fats. I'm not saying you want to, want to go out and, and eat a stick of butter, but you want to have good, healthy fats and balance that in everything you eat. Right. When we eat protein, we want to eat the best. And, and Betsy talked a little bit about, about grass-fed organic beef, which is my favorite. And, and I think Betsy, I Betsy and Julie both raise, raise these uh, wonderful organic uh, cows, and, and I buy them from them. That'd be pretty cool in San Francisco to do that. I just eat them, don't raise them. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're right. Not <laughs> so anyway, we, um, organic, organic and free-range sources for your protein is very important, whether it's beef that's, that's been grass-fed um, or chickens that haven't been treated with hormones and, and antibiotics to grow faster and get to market and be these giant chicken breasts that, that there's a reason for that. Um, we, want, we want organic, uncaged eggs. I started buying my eggs from a farm, and the difference in color is unbelievable. The difference between, between the pale yellow and almost orange color of the good organic eggs, and it's because they have a much higher omega-3 content, they're eating healthy, and so they're giving us more good healthy properties. And people think, oh, I can't eat eggs because I'm worried about cholesterol. Eggs are such a perfect food if you can tolerate them. If you don't have an intolerance to eggs, they have almost a perfect balance of protein and fat, and, and they're good for our body if, if they're the right fo form of them. Wild-caught fish, you don't want any of these farm-raised salmon that they give orange pebbles to, to to make them look like they're the right color. 
always have things that are, that are caught in the wild to get the best nutritional properties from them, and, and non-GMO vegetables. In our country, corn, soy, and wheat are the three top genetically modified crops. It's frightening what they have done to our bodies. And other countries won't even accept our grain. When we export corn, soy, and, and wheat, if it's genetically modified, they don't want it. What makes us think that the great Americans know more than there is to know? And there is a direct correlation between the introduction of genetically modified foods and the increase of food intolerances. I mean, it, they parallel. So you want to avoid genetically modified foods. And one way to do that is to buy organic foods. There are many labels that do now say non-genetically modified products are, are used, but, but if, if in doubt, if you buy organic, you know that it's not genetically modified. Fats. Like I said, fats are so important to us. Our brains are, are, are just dependent on getting the right fat. And, and also, our hormones will will balance better when we have a balance of protein, carb, and fat. And whenever I talk about hormones, I'm not talking about those hot flashes that we have, although that makes a difference too. But, but the hormones, the thyroid, our, our, um, our adrenal glands just get completely stressed out, and so our cortisol is out of whack. By balancing and eating the right fats and getting a balance of protein, carbs, and fat, you help to balance your hormone system. We need fats to create energy. We need fats for everything that we do. So, so we're, when we're, we're thinking nutrition, always think protein, fats, carbs, and the good fats to go with them. We, essential fatty acids are fats that our body needs, but they don't make. And since we don't make them, we either have to get it through our food or through supplementation. And, and I love to try to get food first. I do take supplements, and I certainly take an omega-3 to, to get more of that, but it's essential to our body's good health. A typical American diet, again, is about 40 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. The, the goal that we want to strive for is closer to, to 4 or 5 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3. But I never tell people to add more omega-6 because you get it so it's so common in our diets. What we really need to do to get that balance turned around is eat more omega-3s. Some good, good sources of omega-3 is a flaxseed. And flaxseed, although it's a great source, is highly perishable. And it's not something when, you know, you see breads in the store, those gluten breads that we don't eat anyway, but you see them and they'll say, omega-3, great source of omega-3. Well, it may have flaxseed in it, but any omega-3 benefit has been cooked out. Omega-3, the best way to get this from flaxseed is you need to grind them fresh and eat them without heating them. or we would get omega, you could, you could get flaxseed oil, keep it in your refrigerator and use that oil. You might add it to some smoothies. You could add ground flaxseeds to your smoothie or sprinkle them on something you're eating. But I keep my flaxseeds, I always buy them whole. I keep them in the freezer. I have a little coffee bean grinder that's just dedicated for seeds. And I will grind the flaxseed and use it right away. There are other benefits of flax that aren't omega-3, you can get some fiber and protein if you eat cooked flax, but you're not going to get the omega-3 benefit by having cooked flax. Some other things... Um, it's got a mind of its own. Pardon me? It's got a mind of its own. It does have a mind of its own. Let me see if I can go back. Um, some other good forms of omega-3 would be, would be salmon and Walnuts actually have a good balance of omega-3 and omega-6. It's one of my favorite, so it's one of my favorite nuts. I, I don't care for the, uh, the protein powders that they have on the market, even the ones that are gluten and dairy free and soy free and sugar free. So what I do if I want to add protein to my smoothie is I add raw, um, or raw, raw walnuts. 
that I've soaked, and then I just, I mean, there's no gritty taste, and I just add them to my smoothie in the morning, and I get good protein as well as good fats without having to add any special powders. All right, now I'll go to that. Uh, the other piece of the fats that I wanted to talk about is heated or non-heated fats. Um, some of them, like coconut, you'll see, appears on both lists. There are two forms of coconut. I love coconut oil. I like to eat it. I use it for baking. I use it for cooking. We're going to have fried chicken this afternoon that we cooked that's gluten and dairy free and cooked in um, expeller pressed coconut oil. So expeller pressed coconut oil has a much higher smoke level, a much higher smoke point. So it's good for sauteing. It's good for frying. And the extra virgin coconut oil is good for eating. You might add it to something that's going to be raw. Again, I add that to my smoothie to get some good fat. I actually use coconut oil to spread on toast. I, I know that sounds sort of funny. Um, people say to me when I first got rid of dairy, well, what, what am I going to have? What am I going to put on my bagel? What am I going to have? This is before they've learned to, to sort of limit some of those bagels. But, um, so that what I like to use is either a good quality olive oil, and, and I buy some flavored olive oils that I think are wonderful, or I use coconut oil, the extra virgin coconut oil. One thing that I sometimes do with the, with the coconut oil is take about a half a cup of it and mix in maybe a, a half to a quarter of a teaspoon of, of maple syrup and whip that up, and it tastes like a sweet, creamy butter. Or if you wanted a savory spread, you could add some roasted garlic to that. And, and you've got garlic butter or a sweet butter, and they, they work really well, and they taste wonderful. Some of the other, you can see on this list the difference between the heated oils and the non-heated oils. You don't obviously want to saute with a non-heated oil. You want to keep those non-heated oils from maybe drizzling over cooked vegetables. Or, or using to add to a smoothie, and then keep the, the heated ones that have a higher smoke point for use for cooking. One of the things I just want to point out on that list, avocado oil has the highest smoke point of all the oils. I think it's like 510 degrees. You know, I know that we all know not to have anything with trans fats. We've learned now, I think they're even banned in a number of, of places where you can't have partially hydrogenated fats and, and bad things like that in your food. When, they, when you have oil that starts smoking, you're transforming it at home. So when you use the wrong oil and you try to fry something in the wrong kind of oil and it starts smoking, you're turning it into a damaged fat that's not good for our bodies. I just talk a little bit more about carbs. Just I know I, I mentioned this before. Simple carbs, they're the sugar, the processed foods, and then the complex carbs are those that have fiber, that have more, more good values to them. A lot of the complex carbs also have fat and protein in maybe smaller amounts, but, but those are the grains and, and fruits and vegetables that are, that are really good for us. And we've talked a lot about quinoa. Would we have quinoa that we're cooking today? We have quinoa in, in our granola that we're making. I, I've been cooking so many events lately and, and made quinoa pilaf. I made quinoa salads. There's so much you can do with quinoa. Think of couscous, that little tiny grain that you used to have that was so fast and easy. Quinoa is a healthy version of couscous. So anywhere that you used that, you can add, add quinoa to your diet and get a good complex carbohydrate that's got fiber and and good things. Hi, Jen. Okay. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to go quickly through the next couple slides. So pH, as we talked about earlier, is important for getting the whole body in, in good shape, helping the body to 
uh, be able to do its natural functions of cleansing and nutrients, getting all the nutrients. So P, just a little brief thing on pH. There's acid in this alkaline, and if it's too, if your diet's too acidic, it's usually things like sugars and meat. Although meat is great, it is acid forming, so we want to balance it with some of the alkalizing things and some of the uh, artificial sugars and, and those things very high in uh, acid forming foods. So we want to have we want to firstly get a sense of where you are. Usually, most people in our culture, because of what we eat, are too acidic, and usually want to do more alkaline and that's usually going to be things rich in minerals like vegetables and leafy greens, the fermented foods we talked about. So doing the, getting some of those will help to balance the pH, help get the gut healthy and keep the good bacteria balanced as well as overall for the whole system and the bloodstream and all of that. And there are ways that you can test your urine. There's little urine strips and you can see where you are. The more alkal, this is the confusing part, uh, people often think it's the opposite, but the more alkaline, the higher the number. So that's the important part there. So I will, in the interest of time, pass it on. All right. So we're going to just hurry along here so we can get to the, the food section here. I just want to make this comment. Food manufacturers, restaurants, the bottom line is profit. You are probably not going to get the highest quality unless you make it yourself. So I, I just like to get this, this out of the way and say, you have to cook. So many, of, so many people in, in our, our today's busy, fast-paced life, they don't cook, they reheat. And then when they have a special diet where they have to eliminate certain foods from their diets, they totally freak out because they think, oh my gosh, well, what about chicken nuggets? Well, what about this? What about that? You know, they're used to buying a package, putting it on a, on a cookie sheet, sticking it in the oven, and dinner is done. That's not dinner. That's not good nutrition. Manufacturers are looking for the cheapest quality ingredients so that they can make more money. And we want the best ingredients to make our bodies healthy. We don't care about healthy bottom lines of other people. We want a healthy, healthy person. So we really need to, to rethink the way we look at food. And when we, when we approach this, um, you have to think of kind of, you know, it's not that organic food is expensive, it's that non-organic, traditional or conventional food is ridiculously cheap. Because we should not be expecting to pay cents, pennies for an apple that took all this time and had to grow and, and, the, and the farmer had to transport it to us and all these other ways. We have to be appreciative of the actual Parts of, part of farming and not expect farmers to have to take subsidies to do things as cheaply as they can so that transportation for it is, is where they, things start to ripen and they pick things before it's even ripe. So we have to consider food to be a priority in our life. And then the other part of it is the garbage in, garbage out. I cannot tell you how it frustrates me when I talk to a family who is p potentially um, spending thousands of dollars doing all these therapies and doing all the right vitamins and, and doing things to get the metals out and their own versions of chelation and all this, and then they give their child a bag of Skittles. Mm -hmm. It's like you, so you're going to take out, you're working so hard to get their nutrition level up, you're working so hard to take out these poisons that have been put in your child's body, and then you're going to give them Skittles? So we'll talk about what those, th those pieces are in just a, in a moment. Okay, so I, I just want to quickly give you some, um, what, what's the problem with conventional food and why you want to go organic. First of all, this is a great symbol. It's good, and, and, and it's a good thing to look for, but this is a better symbol. The, 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 to qualify for this, they have to be a lot stricter, and this is getting to be Organics is getting to be such a big market now that it's very spotty. When we're getting so many organics from other countries that are not regulated, it's better to look for this one instead. Our soil is depleted. That's the issue with it. They think, you think, oh, organic, why? How, how important is organic? Can't you just wash off the pesticide? No, you can't. The soil is so depleted because they don't rotate crops. They put terrible herbicides and fungicides on the 
on the soil depleting all the nutrition. So if there is no nutrition in the soil, there is no nutrition in the food. Well, then how does it grow? It grows because they put on nitrogen fertilizers. Nitrogen fertilize, fertilizers can make things grow, but that does not put any nutrition in. So you can be eating one small floret of organic broccoli versus a whole head of conventional and getting more nutrition. So if your child is a picky eater, you better be buying organic produce, especially, and, and well, organic everything because of all the different parts of it. The GMO, we've already kind of talked about. Um, chemical spraying, the, the sprays that are on this. It used to be that they would just spray the food after it was done so that the birds and the insects wouldn't get it. But now what they do is they spray the flower. So when a, a fruit tree or a vegetable starts to flower, they spray it. What does that mean? The pesticide grows into the fruit or vegetable. Corn-fed cattle, that's where E. coli is coming in the way of, of these corn-fed um, cattle, as well as the fact that uh, E. coli is spreading from the fact that they're, they're giving uh, dead cow parts to the cow. So if, if, if the cow has the bacteria and then they use its parts to feed other cows, then it, you just totally spread it. And then that's how mad cow disease goes and all of those other pieces. If you're buying grass-fed beef, and it's best to look for 100% grass-fed beef, then you're going to stay away from that. They did a great study at the University of, Atlanta in Georgia, the University of Georgia in Atlanta, and it was comparing beef the way it was raised in 1930 versus the way it was raised in 2002. And what they found is that the 1930 beef that was all grass-fed versus the way it's raised now in small uh, closed areas, lots of antibiotics, lots of corn, no, they don't even see the pasture, most of them, don't even get to see anything. In many cases, the nutritional difference was 70%. 70% of the meat nutrition has decreased because of the way that we're practicing raising our cows. And why is that? Think of it. They don't get green vegetables. Green vegetables are what balance our pH. They're what gives us our minerals. It's what gives us our vitamins. And they don't get that. They have to eat this grain for every single meal. They're unhealthy, so they're shooting them up with more and more antibiotics. We need to look for grass-fed. If you're having a hard time finding grass grass-fed beef, do a Google search in your area, but please, the one thing I want to say is test it before you buy a half a cow. Not all grass-fed beef is equal. Some of it is horribly chewy, and you can, if you really search around, you can find some absolutely phenomenal grass-fed beef. Arsenic and chicken. Uh, we see a lot of hair tests where we test for metals in our clinic, and arsenic is very high. And the first question my husband asks is, is your child a big chicken eater, especially those McDonald's chicken nuggets? They put arsenic in chicken feed because the chickens don't move. So because they're caged and they can't move, they don't get hungry. So to stimulate their appetite, they give them arsenic. And that arsenic gets into their system and into your chickens. So if you're trying to get rid of the heavy metals, you better also start switching to organic chickens or at least find a farm that does not add any arsenic to their feed. Added hormones, of course, it's all a big thing in the antibiotic use. You're already probably pretty familiar with that. All right. Tell we're getting toward the end. We're just talking a little bit faster and faster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> water is so important, and, and I don't think any of us drink enough, myself included, as much as I try. A little formula for you to know how much water. If you weigh 150 pounds, you need 75 ounces per day, and, and that's a lot of water. It's hard to keep track of that. I'd like to have one of those little abacus things on my, my watch that I could just, every time I drink a glass or finish a bottle, I could move over that little bead so I'd know. There's a lot of tricks. My mother, she fills up a pitcher with 140 ounces of water in it, and she, or no, 70 ounces, she weighs 140 pounds. She, she fills up a pitcher with 70 ounces, and she knows at the end of the day if her pitcher is empty, she drank what she was supposed to drink. Just do little tricks to help you so that you know how much water you, you know, know that you're getting the water that you need. Um, the, the other thing that I want to say about the water, I've heard people say, I just can't. I'm running to the bathroom all the time. Well, it depends on how you drink that water. If you take your glass of water and you just chug this whole thing down, it's kind of like pouring water into a really dry plant. You know when you do that and it runs right out the bottom? But you can take that same glass of water and give it a little bit at a time and it absorbs it and its body actually uses it and it doesn't pour all, all over the floor. It's the same with our bodies. We need to just 
be sipping and drinking water all day long so that we can keep our bodies hydrated. Obviously, we want a nice, clean source of that water. And, and the one thing I just want to say about the shower filters, you can buy a shower filter, and it's under $20, and even I can install it. And you put it right above your shower head. It fits in, in any of them. I got one for our house. We got them at um, Home Depot. Gaim, home. Uh, the website Gaim, G A I A M dot right. com. At, or home, home Depot sells them as well. And they have filters that you can replace every six months. Mm -hmm. And you eliminate the, the chlorine, which is going to be absorbed into your body through the water, but also. The, you're in a hot shower and you get lots of steam and so you're breathing it as well so you're going to be getting all that chlorine and I'd like to get rid of as much of that as I can and, and that's a good way to do that. Okay. What? Not good. The best for, for swimming um, you want to get uh, the best if you have your own pool get an, an ionizer you can get them by a company called oh if you do do a web search, a Google search on like ionizer pool, pool ionizers. They are, that's a way that they ionize the water so you don't have to use any chemicals at all. It's a fabulous way to do it. If you are exposed to chlorine unavoidably, lemon juice helps clean the lymphatics. It will help you detox the chlorine. Um, in talking about other foods, we're going to talk about all of these. The ones that we're not going to talk about in the future slides is corn. So I want to hit this. This is a really important one. I don't want your child living on peanut butter puffs or panda puffs or, no, Gorilla Munch, that's the one, Gorilla Munch. Please stay away from Gorilla Munch. Here's the deal with corn. I, corn is a huge contributor to bacteria in our, in our guts. And it is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem as we are eating so much corn in the form of high fructose corn syrup and corn flours. When you switch off of gluten and casein, switch off of gluten specifically, everybody tends to replace things with corn. And this abundance of corn is going to create its own problems. You can look for it in your child. If you start seeing that, that they have to have corn at every single meal, you know that there's an addiction problem. If there's an addiction problem, there's a good chance there's Klebsiella, Clostridium, all kinds of um, C. Uh, C. difficile, all kinds of uh, different kind of bacteria that are going inside the gut at that point. So you want to be careful of excessive corn. Um, the other one is the nightshade vegetables. I'm just going to touch on this briefly as parasites. Many, many of us have parasites, and we're not even aware of it, and we don't even like to think that it's even a potential, but it's true. And the best way to test if you have parasites or if your child has parasites is to look at them around the full moon. As silly as it may sound, for centuries they've had practices where they see that around the full moon, um, especially with the animals, that's when they would try to deworm them because parasites will surface at that time. If you start seeing a lot of hyperactivity around the full moon or dark circles under the eyes or walking around, they'll tell you in any emergency room that all the crazies come out whenever it's a full moon. There's a lot of truth to that because of the fact that parasites will surface and it'll make you very irritable. You would have a hard time sitting still too if your rectum had parasites, which a lot of these kids actually have. And there's wonderful, very natural ways of treating parasites. Black walnut, for example, is a really good way to do it. But um, the nightshade vegetables are potatoes, tomatoes, peppers of all kinds, and eggplant. And these are, next to sugar, these are parasites' favorite foods. So a lot of people with fibromyalgia find that when they eat the nightshade vegetables that they um, just get very, very tired very quickly. And a lot of it can be that increase of parasites. Can I ask you a quick question about parasites? A lot of our kids, you know, they mouth things. Yes. Like yes. For parasites, it's best to have a, a continuous regime every occasionally, especially if they're swimming in lakes and if they're a, a big dirt eater. And for that, I mean, I, I, I have a very holistic approach, so we, we treat it with homeopathy, but black walnut is, a, is another really good, although it tastes absolutely horrible. Um, we have a lot of different, but it's something that you should do ongoing. Okay, so quickly on soy. Soy is something that you do not want to use in place of your dairy substitutes or as a vegetarian protein source. You really want to ideally eliminate it completely. Uh, there are certain small 
types of fermented soy like miso that has some detoxification benefits and things, but for the most part, I avoid it 100%. Uh, it is one of the top three most common food sensitivities. It's very inflammatory to the gut. When I was talking about the nuts and the seeds and things, and beans, Soy is one of those beans that's very high in the phytic acid and things that are very difficult to digest, create a lot of inflammation. They are also known, it's also known to inhibit thyroid function and disrupt the endocrine system and have estrogens which are not good for developing children whose hormone systems aren't developed yet. So I'm not a fan of soy. I personally avoid it 100% and try to get my, the kids in my practice to do the same. If you there, there, I guess there are a few exceptions that if you needed to do a little or you wanted to do a little, sometimes the fermented soys, because the fermented is going to have all, a lot of those components fermented out, sometimes people do that, but there's a great book called The Whole Soy Story, and it really is hundreds of pages of why you do not want to do any soy at all in your diet whatsoever. And so it, if you need more, if you're a vegetarian and you've been using soy as a main protein source, you really might want to check out this book. It's wonderful, and you'd probably be shocked. I couldn't believe that there there were so many negative things to say about soy until I read that book. It's <laughs> a great book. Uh, beating uh, sugar. So sugar, in addition to being bad for feeding yeast, it also disrupts the immune system. It's not good for the endocrine system. It inhibits the absorption of minerals and takes all of our good nutrients to kind of detoxify and uh, realkalize and all these things we talked about earlier. So lots of reasons just sugar is something you want to keep out of the diet, especially stripped white sugar, which doesn't have any minerals to help process that sugar at all. So some better sweetener options would be agave. Agave is my favorite. It's a honey-like syrup. One of the, the good things about it, it will dissolve in cool liquids, where if you put honey, for example, in a glass of iced tea, it would be a glop at the bottom. Honey, or agave actually is better for that. Agave is natural. It's a low glycemic, so you don't have it and have this big spike in your blood sugar. The next down is tapioca syrup. Tapioca syrup is also low glycemic, and it has some good enzymes. Rice syrup also has good enzymes in them, so these are better sweeteners to use. Again, they're all sweeteners, so we don't want lots of them. And um, Maple syrup, another one that has good enzymes and good health properties to it, but it is higher on the glycemic index, as is honey, higher on the, the glycemic index, so it, it is not one that you want a lot of. And stevia, stevia is a zero calorie sweetener, but it, it really isn't FDA approved as a sweetener. It's only approved as a, a supplement. I'm just not a big fan of stevia. A little bit goes a long way. I don't like the way it cooks. Um, it has a little bitter aftertaste, but, but it is a zero-calorie sweetener that is an option. Um, so with yeast, if you're, if you're d trying to control yeast, there's lots of different ways, and, and definitely is what Julie talked about with SCD, those are all pieces. But in general, for everyone, think of the two big feeders of yeast being Vinegar and sugar, they're two really big ones, and you want to stay away from any sugar, and this doesn't just mean sugar. In fact, I, I kind of like sugar when you look at that compared to high fructose corn syrup. Sometimes I'm relieved to see a product has sugar as opposed to having high fructose corn syrup, which is even worse, and that's going to feed that's going to feed everything a lot faster. But sugar is something that you want to limit as much as possible, if not totally eliminate. And vinegar is the other one, because vinegar will also feed, if you, if you have a lot of yeast, unless it's in the fermented, well, is what you talked about with the fermented form. So it's a, it's a controversial one. But the, the, the basic vinegars, and especially the one in ketchup, because ketchup is your biggest yeast feeder that you can get. You've got both high fructose corn syrup and you have... Um, the uh, vinegar. So artificial sweeteners. So we started off years ago when we were all kids with saccharin. Hoo hoo, big deal. How exciting. Saccharin's out. We're going to all be thrilled. And then about 10 years later, 20, 15, 20 years later, oh, by the way, it causes cancer. And we're like, okay, well, gee, we trusted you, but we'll trust the We'll trust the market again because they're now telling us NutraSweet is the wonderful alternative. Um, and w so NutraSweet comes around and aspartame, and we're thinking, ooh, that's great. That, this tastes so much better than saccharin. It must be better for us. But the actual way that NutraSweet actually even 
passed the FDA was so criminal, it never should have happened. It's, an, it's very, very toxic, and it was causing all kinds of autoimmune from lupus to multiple sclerosis, as well as headaches in many people, and it, because it actually produces methane in your brain. Um, so then aspartame, okay, now we'll start admitting that aspartame's a problem because we have something else for you, and that is sucralose. Oh, how exciting. It's the natural sugar. Yes, it starts off as sugar, but how do they make it, how do they kill the calories? They bleach it. So when you drink sucralose or eat sucralose, you're having basically a chlorinated product. And if you don't think this is going to affect the intestines in your body after time, it's going to be horribly detrimental to what's happening to people's intestines now that they're having basically a bleach in their body all the time. And xylitol is a little bit better. Xylitol um, is still not 100% a digestible product because it is from a tree, but it is better. I only recommend xylitol in small amounts. I would not be using it by the cupful to be making anything, but for things like toothpaste or for gum, it would be a better option. Um, but these are some of the things that you can get as causes for those. And then these foods high in artificial sweeteners, you have your, um, you know, all these things. Candy is the big one. The gums, all of these, all very, very big in artificial sweeteners. The other food I need to talk to you about, because they know I'm passionate about it, and even though we're low on time, I've got to talk about Fruity Pebbles. Because next, <laughs> next to Skittles, Fruity Pebbles make me even sadder, because people actually think that this is a breakfast. And Fruity Pebbles are nothing more than paste and food coloring and artificial sweetener. And Julie's going to talk about, I think you're going to be talking about food coloring in just a second. But, um, the, the, the artificial, sweet, the, the Fruity Pebbles, I truly did not think they could make this product any worse because it was, it's like, you know, you have Mountain Dew and you're like, how can you make it worse? Well, then you make it Red Mountain Dew. It, 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 it is worse. And then, but the Fruity Pebbles are the ones that really concern me because now they have a half calorie one or a lower, like they, like they're, they lower it. And what is this? This is the most horrible combination of excitotoxins on the planet because what they did is they got rid of half the corn syrup and they added Splenda to it. Now, all of these excitotoxins, food coloring, Splenda, NutraSweet, they're all tested individually through the FDA, although the FDA doesn't really have our concern at hand, but they pass that. But when you combine them, they are 10 times more lethal. So, so this Fruity Pebbles Light is one of the most horrible combinations. Even though it is GFCF, it is one of the most horrible combinations of foods. It's not food. It's whatever it is. You want to talk. Okay. And that, that's the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll just go briefly since Betsy's explanation was so passionate. Uh, <laughs> artificial colors are made with petroleum base, all artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. So if you are familiar with the fine gold diet, that's one of the big groups of ingredients or additives that they avoid because they can be really problematic. They can cause all sorts of migraines, digestive problems, hyperactivity, all sorts of things. So avoiding them is really important. And interestingly, the original food colors that were created after the war, before the FDA was implemented, were all grandfathered in as safe until they've proven them to be toxic. And so year after year, we go through the list and knock more and more off the list. So n new ones coming out might have to go through that process, but a lot of the old ones didn't. So you might see red number let's say, uh, red dye number five and number 40. Well, what happened to all those numbers in between? <laughs> they uh, got eliminated. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'll just leave it at that. They're, uh, they're definitely the, one of the easiest, best things you can do for your family is just avoid all the artificial stuff. It's simple to do. You could go to Whole Foods or some of these other stores and get the, you wouldn't even have to change the diet. Just get your candy, your cereals, everything free of artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. And just that one thing would be so beneficial for everybody. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, I oh should I do it? Okay. I'll do this. I, you, you do it. I'll do this one too. <laughs> uh, nitrates and nitrites, uh, n n things in bacon, lunch meats, really you want to avoid those. They have cancer and carcinogen carcinogenic effects. You can often find these foods without these ingredients. So whenever you can do that, it's really, really of benefit to you and your family. And then MSG is the other big uh, neurotoxin next to aspartame. It is... Uh, it can cause inflammation of the GI tract. 
it has a whole variety of challenges. And so what I want to talk more about where you find MSG because many of you probably have heard of it and try to avoid it. And if you see monosodium glutamate or MSG, you might avoid that on the label. But they've gotten sneaky because the same companies that most many of the same companies that make your standard commercial foods also make your health organic foods. And so they know that people don't want it. So they sneak it in under fancy names. So hydrolyzed vegetable protein, hydrolyzed soy protein, all of those hydrolyzed proteins have about 40% MSG. And because it's not more than 51%, you don't have to list it as having MSG. You can even say contains no MSG on the front and have the ingredients on on the back. Also a lot of the yeasts. If it's not something you'd expect like bread to have yeast or a nutritional yeast, then pretty much it's probably MSG. So uh, autolyzed yeast, yeast extracts, those sorts of things. You're going to find those in anything that is going to be usually meaty or cheesy in flavor. So soups, broths, gravies, all of your artificial imitation meat products, all your vegetarian soy and gluten wheat uh, products, often, I would say probably almost all of the time, use MSG because it makes it taste meaty. So really, really read your label. And I have to say that Whole Foods, while I, I love them, uh, they are loaded with MSG. If you go there, you will see MSG all over the place. So that's the one ingredient you really need to read the label on. All right, we've learned so many things already and covered so much information. I actually teach a two-hour class on meal planning, so I'm going to give you the, the minute overview of meal planning. We wouldn't drive across the country without a map, yet every day we walk into the grocery store and we look at the aisles and wait for some inspiration to jump <laughs> out at us and say, oh, yeah, I want you for dinner tonight. And we spend too much money and we go home and say, oh, I can't do this special diet because it costs too much. A way to avoid spending too much money is have a meal plan. If you have a meal plan, then you make a grocery list and you just buy what you need. You don't come home from work or from your day's activities and open the refrigerator and wait for dinner to jump out at you or look in the freezer and see what can you reheat. You have a plan, you have a grocery list, you don't spend too much money, and you eat a balanced diet. It is very, very important. It is the roadmap to success. It will save you money, reduce stress. It's good all the way around. The other component of meal planning that I think is very important is eating with the seasons, which I know we talked about and Betsy mentioned. The whole thing of if you live in the Midwest, you're not going to buy strawberries in February because they've been shipped from 5,000 miles away. And in order to still look like strawberries by the time they arrive here, they've treated them with so many chemicals that they're, they're not food anymore. They're bad for us and we want to avoid things like that. The next thing that we need to remember is that we have to balance protein, carbs, and fats every time you eat. You want to, to have a goal of five meals a day. That means a healthy snack is not just an apple, although an apple is a really good thing to have, or a pear or whatever. A better option would be an apple and a handful of walnuts, some kind of protein, fat, and carb. Because when you eat balanced like that, all of your hormones function better. Your blood sugar doesn't go spiking up. You're not as hungry as fast. So if you have a balance of protein, carb, and fat, every meal, every snack, you will balance your hormones, feel better, stay satisfied for a longer period of time. Okay, so in conclusion, before we get cooking, uh, we'll have a little break in just a moment. These are just a few things that are, will help make this whole piece a lot greater of a success. You definitely want to look at your family needs. What is it going to take? What are the main days you want to cook? Maybe Sunday may be a day where you cook and you freeze and you get things prepared. You want to address the picky eating, the texture, and the visual concerns. Um, know what your family's favorite. You'd be amazed. If, even if you came up with seven meals, that's one once a week. Most people don't eat much more variety than that anyway. Even if you just had every Monday we're having some sort of a chicken, every Tuesday we're going to have some sort of a, a hamburger something, or a meatloaf or something like that. Um, uh, and then of course include in your grocery list, know what you need, look at your hard to find ingredients, shop in, in bulk as much as you possibly can, buy um, 
you know, half of cows is, go directly to the farmer. That will save you a lot as well, too. This was yours, or this was Julie's. I'm sorry, Julie. Ah. This was your Julie, uh, come up yeah. and join us. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to just continue yeah, or go sure. on to the next slide? I think we should just jump in together. Okay. I, sure. Uh, we, oh, no. There we go. So you already moved it. I'm sorry. Then, then, then this piece here, this is really important. The piece, the obstacles, the cost too much. Um, I have to say that this is something that makes me upset when I hear that um, a family will not eat well because of the cost, but yet they're, everybody on the, on the family is on a medication and they're paying $300, $400 a month for medication. If you don't eat well, the cost will catch up to you, I promise. Because if you don't eat well now, you will be dealing with loss of work because you can't move. You will be dealing with um, all kinds of further problems and complications, constantly having to go to the doctor. This, our life depends on it, and this is a very small investment to have us eating well. Plus you'll have more energy and your kids will most likely be happier and doing better and you won't have to spend so much time on that and you'll have more time to cook and everybody will be better. And, right. and in, include your children in cooking. I mean, you can, you don't have to be the sole cooker in the family. I think it's really important to ask people what they want, ask them to help you. You know, everybody, this is a family, it's a family deal. The, so, and then the, lastly, the piece with the too hard, and, and I like this, you know, change your focus, change your focus. Mm -hmm. If you go into the saying this is going to be too hard, it will be too hard and it will overwhelm you. Look at this as a fun way to help your health. This is such a great gift that's been given to you that you have been able to um, hear what it takes to make your family into a healthy state. And this is a message that people don't get because they're not going to get it from television because there's too much media involved in the decision. They're not going to get it from the newspapers because there's too many advertisers who aren't going to like it. And they're not going to get it from the medical community because my husband is a pediatrician and he never once, never once got a medical course on nutrition. Never once. So you have to get it from outside sources you need to read and you have to look at the people who don't have anything to gain from it. We're all volunteers for you here today. And if it feels too hard, just do one thing at a time. So we're going to tell you lots of things because we only have today with you. Don't feel like, oh, I have to do all of this or I'm failing. Just pick one thing. Pick yes. a few things. Pick which things you can handle. And over time, and probably all of us, it's taken us years to, a little Excellent. by little, learn all, yes. all these Excellent. little pieces. Excellent point. It does. It's taken us all years to get here. So great. All right. Anything, can we break? or? I right? just want to... To, we're going to start cooking, but before we do that, I wanted to just give you an overview of the day. You're going to have a 15-minute break, at which point we're going to transform this stage into a kitchen, and we're going to start cooking for you. We're going to cook primarily GFCF. The first part will go till 12.30. At 12.30, you get an hour lunch break on your own. Then we'll come back. We will do the SCD, fermented foods, and then after that, we'll take another break, and we will have our little Ask the Chef Q&A. So when you come back, I'm going to have little cards for you that you can write down your questions, because as you think of things, you're going to have questions. And then instead of asking us right then on the spot, because there, there's a number of reasons with that. Everybody can't hear because we're being webcast. People don't know the questions. Once we have your questions, we'll answer all of them, and everyone will benefit from them. And, and all of the afternoon foods are GFCF as well, so they're GFCF and SCD, so there's lots of that that's going to overlap. That's, that's what is so great about this, this day. Everything we make will be acceptable for, I believe,